the article's meant to yeah, I mean, you know, it, this yeah. is all speculation. So, yeah. you know, let's focus the lesson. We don't know what we know. Let's yeah. focus okay. more yeah. on what we know because if we're going to speak out, we don't know this. Or, we could say, like, we don't know in general, but you can kind of, you know, almost, uh, I apologize, bring it, uh, you know, what yeah. Yeah. Makes it, even though it's Hollywood, you know, but still. Um, do you remember? I think, I think what's important uh, for the people who are attending, uh, and I think that most people may know this already, when there are no firsthand accounts, uh, either from eyewitnesses or from the person uh, whom we're speaking about, um, it's impossible to know what's truth. Correct. Right. What's we could, real? We could mention that as well. When you guys are going to talk about the slavery. Yeah. And, well, so the real issue for me is that is that the Roman Empire went through a lot of changes. We know a lot about the Roman Empire in the first century uh, uh, common era. Um, uh, we all, but the, the conditions of the gladiator combat were very different. The gladiators were expensive slaves. Um, a lot of the gladiators in the first century were, were prisoners of war. Um, and then a choice. They could, they could be worked to death in the fields and the mines, or they could die glorious in the arena with a sword in their hand. Um, and they, they were warriors and knew how to handle equipment, so they didn't need a whole lot of training. Uh, the Gauls were not a united people. Um, it was easy enough to get Gauls to fight each other or fight Thracians, and the Thracians were kind of like that as well. Um, so, you know, we're not sure how that system worked. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, yeah, we're, tell them, but we're not sure. I, and, yeah, I, you know, I, I will mention. Yeah, la later, later okay. on, this is what happened. You know? Yeah, I, I will mention the uh, uh, um, Scipio's uh, funeral games when the Spanish volunteered to be his gladiators. Oh, I see. And, and um, of course, there's the myth when the when uh, Rome was founded by Romulus. Romulus said that it um, that a father could uh, send his slaves into uh, send his son into slavery. Yeah. Like that was a, fat, a grounding a rule of the uh, a first Roman uh, society. Well, a Roman, a Roman father had power of life and death over his family. And to some extent, the human sacrifice at the ceremony, at the funerals, were designed to accentuate that point. And the gladiator combat was a more merciful version. I got one, one of the slaves gets to survive. Right. Um, Oh, that yeah. may be a modern claim rather than something the Romans believed in. Um, Where is everybody? Okay. Yeah. Well, well, it's not nine o'clock yet. Oh, sorry, it's not twelve o'clock. Well, yeah, but I'll I, give it a minute or two. No, I know. I was, we're going to give them ten minutes. You know, yeah. it's just, uh, usually, you know, whenever I have so many people, it, the yeah. people come in earlier. Uh -huh. I don't yeah. know. But because I've moved it so many times. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward, yeah. And, and guys, thank you for doing this. And, you know, apologize. Greg had something. But I, I guess we're the main presenters at this point. Yeah. So it doesn't uh -huh. matter. You know, and... Um, How's you know, your mother-in-law? She's doing what... Well, so you know, the, the, the deal was, you know, I don't, I don't really speak too much on record. You know, otherwise I'm going to end up being without a mother-in-law. <laughs> she basically went into Panera Bread. And um, there was um, slippage. And she hit her head on a counter, oh. and then she fell, and her shoulder uh, basically broke, and um, and her head got split. So she needs sixteen stitches, okay. and uh, so and then I got a call like at ten o'clock. I was like, oh, okay. I gotta run. Yeah. Oh, here we go. People are coming in right now. Hey, for sure. Uh, if you don't mind, just okay. it's us gonna be on a panel for now, and yeah. then, um, you know. If I see, you know, and then we'll ask people to obviously raise hands during the intermission. We can unmute them. Uh, you can guys help me with that if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, that would be awesome. Okay. Just we're muting or unmuting. I'm muting. Uh, okay. So let's say a person will raise hand. Yeah. We'll unmute them oh. and, okay. Uh, 
once yep. all right they're done you can lower their hand uh and then you know read the questions from the uh thing if let's say you guys are speaking and i get a question and there's going to be intermission so the way it's going to go is uh, i'm going to start then i'm going to give uh, first it's you howard because you're going to talk about that chart remember the chart yeah, where yeah, okay so that's first you then beverly is going to talk about slaves after i finish with rations mm -hmm. and then yeah. after that you're going to talk about the yeah. uh i'll tell you like you know, howard is yeah. next and you're going to talk about the okay. uh, yeah. gladiators and then i'm going to continue and finish the story so I'm, we're going through a story and i also have some clips to play so it would be interactive. <laughs> yeah. Oh, who's, uh, who's, oh my God. I think it's uh, Patty, the Betty. Let me yeah. see. So, That's this is gonna be tricky. Are we gonna be able to see hands raised um, if we get a large group? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, we'll have to keep scan. Might be better if they send us a text. Yeah, yeah. text, I, I don't know that. If they use a chat mode, uh, yeah, I mean, either either or, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, so far it's eleven. Like I said, I kept moving it, so I don't know. Yeah, no. If it's eleven people, it's no problem seeing hands up. If you get several dozen people, it's going to be hard for us to see that. They need they better off if they text us. Yeah, and then also Howard, um, <coughs> yeah, my my correction, but just slow it down a little bit, and just you know, because oh. people like to listen because oh. everything you say is amazing. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> But I should set floor. Yeah. Okay. So slow it down and yeah. you know, don't worry, as long as it takes. I don't care. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And I I sometimes speak very fast too. Yeah. Yeah. And um, by the way, what do you see on the screen right now? I see Spartacus myth or reality. I see your first slide. Okay. You don't see anything else? Like notes? No. Okay, I don't see anything else. No. No. Because I have a presenter's view and I'm trying something yeah. new. Uh -huh. And then, you know, obviously, I'm going to show my face if people want to see. Nobody wants to see my face. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there, who's there. Everything is very slow on my end. So huh. uh, if you guys help me out, that'd be awesome. Like somebody just sent a question or just somebody just put it in the chat. Let's see. Oh, we got Aaron. Who said what? Oh, Zach, you made us dedicated people really track this down tenaciously. <laughs> Penny or Betty, how are you? All right, and so far 15 people. So while, you know, hmm. it's 12 o'clock, so I'm not gonna start, but I just wanna talk about our group, right? Um, you know, as you people are joining, so please, uh, Beverly and Howard, can you admit people as I speak? Yeah, okay. Okay, perfect. So um, our group is history mostly ancient. Uh, we have other groups that's uh, food and cultural, but if you look at Meetup, it's called history mostly ancient, um, you'll find that we have a lot of programs. Like for example, uh, tomorrow, we're gonna talk about uh, the brief history of shamanism. Um, and uh, we're basically going to talk about spirituality of uh, shamanism. You know, we're not going to refer to like Siberian shamanism, you know, versus the uh, you know uh, island shamanism stuff like that. It's just spirituality because the modern shamanism is kind of like making its way back. Uh, then um, tonight, actually, we have Asian philosophy, and we're going to talk about Confucian Confucianism of Tang Dynasty. Um, then. On Thursday, Richard is actually doing the uh, French um, uh, uh, French mandate of Syria and Lebanon. So it's a you know French conquest of French colony of uh, uh, Syria of Lebanon. Uh, that's going to be Richard. Then on Saturday, if you're in New York, if you want to make your way to uh, the Jewish Museum at 11 uh, a.m., uh, we're actually going to a Jewish Museum, followed by the um, Indian restaurant called Flames Indian Aroma. Uh, so if anybody wants to join 11 a.m. on Saturday, and we're going to particularly visit an exhibit um, Jewish museum that's called 1960-1964 um, uh, uses the Jewish museum influential role in early 1960s New York art scene. 
uh, as a jumping off point to examine how artists living and working in New York see respond to the events that mark this moment in time. All right, so uh, then um, going through our events, we have uh, after the Jewish Resume Nest Saturday, um, on that same Saturday at night, uh, we're gonna have um, Chinese uh, cosmologists in the Song Dynasty, which is part of the Asian philosophy um, uh, group by Jason. Then on um, 29th uh, Saturday, uh, which is a week later, we're gonna actually do Ugaritic language, part of the dead language series. We did Sumerian, we did Akkadian, you know, we're, so we're continuing on that. Then um, Ralph, uh, which I met yesterday, we actually went to the um, exhibit uh, in New York, in New York uh, Soci History Society, um, Historical Society, and we visited the uh, solemn witch trials. Uh, and it was amazing, and I followed by the um, pizza uh, after that. Um, then um, on uh, November 3rd, we're going to talk about Zionism and uh, and Palestine and uh, Jordan. Uh, then on uh, November 6th, on Sunday, we're going to talk about Leonore of Aquitaine, powerful women series. Okay. So, um, you know, we'll give it, give it, you know, five, 10 minutes more, um, you know. Yeah. I don't know. It's because I kept moving. Let me just tell people that we're alive so that I think I think people are going to be joining in, or at least I hope so. Oh, we need a size group here. All right. I guess I'm, I'm not going to. All right. So while we're talking, let me introduce the speakers. Um, so again, uh, our group started as history, mostly ancient, and uh, Beverly and Howard has been around with us for um, at least two years, uh, both. Um, initially Howard, then Beverly joined. And, um, you know, uh, Beverly, you know, had done several presentations. Howard had, done, had done several presentations. And thank you for, today they're gonna be actually talking, Howard is gonna talk about the gladiators, and particularly as it relates to Spartacus. Uh, we don't know much about the gladiator, um, you know, as a Spartacus, but Howard is going to touch on upon that. And then um, Beverly is going to mention uh, how the slavery, again, we don't know much about Spartacus being a slave uh, prior to becoming a gladiator. He, he will talk about generally slavery in Rome. So that's the best way we can kind of give you a picture of it. I will generally be a moderator and I will talk about the Spartacus revolt and uh, different timelines and talk about different, not battles, but mentioning uh, you know, how he progressed through uh, Rome and um, basically he almost thrashed Rome and even walking toward Rome at one point. Uh, so I'll give it a couple of more minutes. Uh, let me just tell people we're live. I'm trying to knit Jim. Oh, there we go. That's another one. Okay, there's one. Yeah, can you, can you press admit? Oh, well, that's working. Thank you. Excellent. Yep. There we go. Excellent. Excellent. You see what happens when you move uh, event too many times. You <laughs> lose people. Yeah. Is that working? Yeah, it's iPhone. Here we go. Thank you so much. All right. So if you don't mind, um, uh, we, we for now. Actually, uh, our group is getting large enough. That if someone puts their hands up, I don't know if we're going to see it. If you have a question, could you please chat? Do what you go to put it in the chat thing, and we'll yeah. pick you up there. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll see. I can see the chat. I okay. can't. We we can see the chat. Okay. Uh, so for now, just Howard, uh, yeah. mute yourselves. Um, and then I will uh, go ahead with our presentation. Um, all right. And you don't forget to admit people, please. Yep. Thank you. All right. So. Let me just. Uh, 
just all right please mute mute yourselves for now beverly i'll unmute you later um let me see if there's anybody else is muted so this way we you know all right so except me oh there's one person not muted all right perfect all right Hi, uh, my name is Zakar. I am actually um, a founder and organizer for a group called um, History Mostly Ancient. You can check us out on Meetup. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel called uh, Fitness Hi History um, Philosophy. Uh, we have about you know uh, several thousand members uh, or subscribers, not members, um, and you can check us out. We have about 340 presentations there stemming from uh, Sumerian, um, you know, culture and Mesopotamian culture all the way to Rome. And then we also have Middle Eastern presentations there, you know, Roman and ancient philosophy and so forth, so on. So today's presentation, we're gonna talk about Spartacus, right? So on the left, I have some questions, right? For people, so kind of to make it interactive. If you guys want, um, you can kind of uh, throw your answers on the chat, um, you know, kind of, you can self-explanatory, um, uh, true or false, uh, one through 10, uh, very easy, you know, was Spartacus a slave? Spartacus, you know, was, you know, uh, you know, was he in Roman legion? Spartacus decided to become gladiator. So just, and then we'll, we'll get to the answer and see how you answered it, uh, so to speak. So um, let me minimize everybody. Okay, so Spartacus, um, uh, the slave who made Rome tremble, according to the legend, Spartacus' wife once walked on uh, her sleeping husband um, one night to find uh, that a snake wrapped itself around the fa his face. Instead of being alarmed, she took this as a prophecy. She was kind of like an oracle um, in Thracian culture. Uh, she was considered to be a fortune teller. Just like the serpent surrounded itself around the warrior's head, uh, so shall Spartacus be enveloped by a greater and fearful power. So we, you know, no one, you know, basically we don't know whether she interpreted it to be um, him trumping uh, and then at some point like, excelling in battle against Rome uh, or being great or fearful, powerful, or maybe it was his doom. But apparently the serpent uh, was the, his prophecy. So no, no one mentions the uh, success of Crassus in putting down a slave uprising. Instead, they talk about the triumph uh, and bravery of Spartacus. Um, according to Plutarch, um, who actually wrote the uh, War of Spartacus or the Life of Crassus, um, and Appian, who, is, who was another writer, um, you know, uh, basically they mentioned the most about the Spartacus. But there was two other writers who, uh, the, whose works didn't really survive. Uh, one was Tit Levy, uh, works about Spartacus didn't survive, and uh, Celeste, uh, who were not who were contemporaries at the time, and uh, basically they wrote um, you know early life of Spartacus, and there was more, but they, they worked and survived, so we don't know a lot about it. So uh, let's move um, to the next slide. One second. All right, so what I wanted to do is initially, so you can get, get a kind of taste, I want to play a clip from um, the Starnes uh, series uh, on Spartacus. Okay, let me just be quiet and play this clip for a second. You let me know if... Um... All right, everybody got a point. So this was, this was the beginning of the revolt. I just wanted to play that um, clip for a second. So now um, let's see how everybody answered the questions. Uh, let's look at the chat for a second. So, um, uh, well, actually only one person <laughs> answered, but um, I mean, it, it, it kind of, Spartacus was born and raised as a slave. Spartacus was once a Roman legion. Spartacus decided to become later and so forth, so on. So you just see how you did. Um, and it, it kind of just like to, to start interactivity. So, um, let me just tell you that there's only one surviving uh, picture of Spartacus 
that um, uh, that actually survived in Pompeii. According to this um, land, uh, the house owner in Pompeii, as I understand, uh, after the Vesuvius erupted, um, on the top you can see what had survived. In the name of the person was Felix, who was the basically a slave owner, and uh, he saw uh, Spartacus in one of, in one of the amphitheaters. Um, basically being uh, being a gladiator and he's depicted it. So the famous Spartacus graffiti from Pompeii, it shows fighting scene. Here are two horsemen fighting each other and one of them is called Sparta, Spartax, um, written in Asken. Just uh, because it was written in Asken does not mean it dates uh, to the early first century BC. As you know, uh, Vesuvius at the time of Spartacus did not erupt yet. So uh, even though Pompey was covered, but this would actually survive. Um, I don't know. Uh, so, in any case, uh, this is basically a depiction of the, the only surviving graffiti that mentions it. Okay, let's go to the next page. All right, uh, Howard, you want to explain this um, timeline? Yeah, well, I, I've been attaching this to all my presentations in ancient Rome. The really crucial thing is that the is that the decline and fall of the Roman Republic happened fairly quickly. I can see I forgot to hide my sketch layer when I, when I exported this. Uh, this all happened very quickly. These, you know, like Marius and Sulla were dead by the time, by the time uh, Spartacus came along. But the, these guys were all contemporary. Crassus, Pompey, Caesar, and Cicero were all important guys in Rome. Um, <clears throat> uh, but this the, the Roman Republic collapsed fast. It was a functional thing in 100 BC, and by 33 BC it was toast. I, 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 this is a crucial thing we need to understand, and we can see that uh, Crassus, uh, uh, Spartacus is about 70 BC, a little bit after the death of Sulla. Uh, we can see that Crassus, Pompey, Caesar, and Cicero were all act were all active and important, and Augustus was on his feet by this time. Correct. Thank you, uh, Howard. So just to take it further and then maybe remember this as we're going to go through the slides, um, there was actually before Spartacus, which is very important, and you can see it on timeline, there was actually a civil war that broke out and uh, between Marius and Sulla. And Sulla basically, um, you know, responded with a tremendous bloodletting through the uh, prescriptions, basically. Okay. Then in 91 BC, the, the social war has wrecked the Italian Peninsula. Oh, yeah. That's right. I forgot to mention, just, to, yeah, you're right here. Just as a note, uh, Marius and Sulla died of old age. Um, Augustus died of old age. Everybody else here was killed. Perfect, perfect. Well, not perfect, but when they almost compare <laughs> Roman emperors to mafia bosses, right? Um, you know, uh, so to speak. So all the mafia's bosses, you know, most of them don't end up uh, well. I guess that's probably... <laughs> coming back from the Roman Empire. So anyway, in 91 BC, the social war has wrecked the Italian peninsula, pitching Rome against the former Italian allies, you know, they call them Soci. Um, uh, although they were victorious by 87 BC, the Romans recognized the need for change. Citizenship was extended throughout Italy. Spartacus revolt evidently tapped into the uh, uh, febrile atmosphere of change and upheaval in Italy. So if you think of it, how many people had lived on the land of uh, italics, so to speak? You have Samnites, you have uh, Etruscans, you have all this, you have Latins. And believe it or not, you know, uh, italics were not granted citizenship. So uh, this was kind of uh, a prelude to uh, uh, them getting a citizenship. And therefore, right around the same time or a little bit after, um, you know, the, the, uh, the third survival war had erupted. So let's continue on the slides. All right, so we're just gonna go through a little bit of timeline. So in 73 BC, that's, you know, uh, Spartacus basically uh, becomes a slave, uh, lives in Capua under the uh, Lenista, which is the slave owner or the owner of the uh, gladiators called Batiatus, uh, uh, Lantulus Batiatus, uh, and he was basically trained uh, um, as a Thracian. 
Um, and then uh, Spartacus escapes in 73 BC, so around the, uh, that same time. We'll get into the detail. Um, and basically, they take refugee um, around the same time at the mountain of Vesuvius. Then, you know, Rome kind of sends a, a, a cohort or two to attack. Uh, but yeah, it's not really a, a pretty forceful action because if you think of it, slaves were not considered to be um, any anything um, you know uh, of you know major note. And if you would fought a slave and you were, for example, a consul, uh, you would get uh, you would get no uh, glory from it. If you lose, you you lose your face completely. But if you win. It is no, uh, there's absolutely no glory uh, to derive. And also remember, they're fighting on Italian land and there is no uh, loot to, you know, to steal. And uh, Roman legions, and believe it or not, Roman army, uh, you know, they always, you know, try to divide the loot from the, uh, for example, invading of Parthian, invading of uh, other regions, Mitrodites and stuff like that. So then um, we have, uh, two survival wars prior to the uh, third survival war. This is Spartacus called, war called third survival war, um, led by Spartacus. Uh, then you know uh, he defeats the you know aforementioned uh, Claudius Glauber, uh, who came with two or three cohorts, which is really not much of an effort by Rome. Um, after many successes, he eventually meets um, you know some counselors. You know uh, that were sent. To, uh, to defeat him, and then uh, eventually, you know, going through timelines, 71 BC, his final battle, uh, he gets to fight um, against Crassus, and I will get to all that. I just wanted to show timelines so everybody on the same page. All right, so uh, Plutarch, right? Uh, you know, Plutarch uh, and Appian are the first uh, writers that basically. Um, that wrote mostly, but that was 150 years after it happened, after the uh, third survival war of Spartacus. So a lot of their accounts is kind of hearsay. And like I said, the two uh, contemporaries, um, uh, Tit Levy and Serville, didn't really survive. Their works didn't really survive. So therefore, um, the the war of Spartacus, it was written by a Plutarch, was um, you know somewhat a little controversial. Uh, there's almost no history from the early life of Spartacus, all hearsay, nobody really knows who he is. And then even there's no history from Gladiator, how was he as a gladiator and stuff like that. So it was interesting uh, in that regard. And then we'll get to the discrepancy. And today we're actually going to talk about what was real, what was not, and then what was speculation and so to, so to speak. All right. So Spartacus was Thracian. Okay. So according to the scientist Sigler, the region, the region, um, the region of the Spartacus remains, you know, as a Thracian, remains to be very obscure. Okay, some thought, uh, believe it or not, that he was Greek, uh, and some even thought that he was Roman. Actually, in absence of the written historical records, before they got into contact with the Greeks, basically, so Thracians basically were not known until they became they actually had a contact as a nationality with Greeks. If you look at the map, it's a current day Bulgaria. And what's interesting, the evidence of the proto-Thracians in the prehistorical period depends on the artifacts of material culture, okay? Leo Klein identifies proto-Thracians with a multi coordinate wear, uh, wear culture that was pushed away from Ukraine by advancing timber grave culture or Srubnaya. Srubnai in Russian, if you don't know, Russian means cutting, basically cutting the timber. It is generally proposed that the Proto-Thracian people developed from a mixture of indigenous people and Indo-European. So it's a combination. He was in a combination of that. So what's interesting is he was particularly a Thracian that uh, was uh, connected to the tribe called Moedi. And uh, the reason we think it is Moedi, or we know Plutarch made a mistake by basically referring to him as nomad, but he meant Moedi. And that's what proven in 19th century that was the case. Again, it's a speculation. And that I just wanted to talk about Thracians if he is from Thracia. So this is a Thracian culture. I just, basically uh, they were barbarians, right? As you can see, this is artifacts from all of them. Thracians were regarded by other people as warlike 
ferocious, bloodthirsty barbarians. They were seen as barbarians by ancient Greeks, Romans. Plato and his Republic um, uh, groups them with the Scythians. Scythians are actually uh, are from the current day Crimea and, uh, and Ukraine or Mr. Ukraine. And they were nomads that predate, they were actually Iranian, Ir Iranic looking tribes. So he connects them, not a DNA connection, no DNA connection, but he's saying they were nomads, calling them extravagant and high spirited. And his laws portray them as warlike nation, grouping them with Celts, Celts, Persian, Scythian, Iberian. Um, so this is what Carthage talk about them. You remember Carthage was the outpost or the colony of you know Phoenicians, and so uh, basically Polybius wrote of the uh, uh, of them as being a gentle character. I like most you know um, you know uh, that's what uh, Tacitus, for example, his Annals, which is another writings, um, you know, described them as savage, wild, impatient, disobedient, even to their own kings. And as on the left, you can see their king Theseus the third. From his tomb. So this is one of the um, uh, tombs engravings, and this was actually one of the Thracian kings on the left. His name is Theseus the uh, Third. And according to Victor Dure, further notes that they considered husbandry unworthy of a warrior, and they knew no source of gain by war and theft, and that they practiced human sacrifice, which has been confirmed by archaeological evidence. Uh, this actually one of our um, own uh, had posted the outfit of a Thracian, uh, Mr. Beck. And so I just wanted to put it right here. And on, on the, in the middle, uh, this is basic uh, Scandian Thracian soldier of the Archimedean army. So if you remember Archimedean army was the, uh, uh, you know, the famous, um, so to speak, emperors were Xerxes and Darius II. So uh, Apparently, Thracians uh, were part of the Archimedes army that sacked Athens and lost a marathon and Thermopylae and so forth, so on. All right, let me just continue. So what I wanted to do is let me just mention a couple of things and I'm going to pass the, um, I'm going to take a couple of questions. And I'm going to pass the, you know, uh, uh, the baton to uh, Beverly. But basically they say um, what happens is uh, Spartacus ended up joining the Roman auxiliary, right? The Roman auxiliary was used in the Roman army for the, um, basically for the uh, tribes that uh, would be an affiliate of the Rome, so to speak, or the, the states that live within their borders. And um, they were basically kind of like uh, expendable troops, so to speak. Uh, and what happened is they thinking that he was, uh, he deserted. Uh, according to some sources, you know, uh, Romans wanted to attack uh, Mithridates and they wanted to use him as auxiliary. It was too far from his land and he was not interested in going to Bosphorus. And therefore, he basically deserted. And, but at some accounts, they said that he actually um, was attacking Rome uh, after serving there and uh, therefore became enslaved um, uh, after, you know, this raiding parties against Rome. Uh, and then as a slave, um, you know, he caught an eye of, uh, like I said, slave owner. His name is Lantulus Batiatis, a Roman who owned gladiator school called Ludus or in Capua. So the gladiator school called Ludus. He was always in lookout. I mean, Batiatis was always lookout uh, for strong goals, Thracians, who could shed some blood for the pleasure of the crowd. Okay. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Beverly and she's gonna talk about slavery in Rome because we don't have much of an account of uh, how was he as a slave. Let me take some questions first or read some comments and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. Okay, so um, for example, Stephen Beck had said, a uh, friend studying in Bulgaria said Spartacus honored uh, there as a his he hero of an ancient Thrace as Alexander Macedon and Greece. Any new archaeology findings there? Um, yeah, I've shown, you know, basically, but I don't think there was any archaeological on Spartacus uh, was found in Thrace. It, it's just like Macedonians portraying Alexander the Great as being their uh, hero. Uh, there's nothing to do with Macedonians as Slavs, and Alexander the Great obviously is Greek. 
Do you think that Plutarch as a Greek praised Spartacus at uh, backhanded criticism uh, from uh, uh, No, there's no accounts of him praising Spartacus. The only person uh, that actually was against Spartacus was Floor. And, uh, he was very negative against Spartacus and he said he deserved everything was coming to that. But Plutarch was just basically mentioning the facts. There wasn't, um, uh, there wasn't any praising. Also, Howard. Uh, well, I, I was just responding there. Plutarch, there's no question in my mind that Plutarch, Plutarch and a lot of his articles has an agenda. And in his, all of, all of what we know about Spartacus from Plutarch comes from his article on Crassus. And he keeps emphasizing that Crassus was, was a piece of work. Um, he was he lacked nobility. He was greedy. Um, essentially, all, almost all of his habits were good. He was just greedy for money and stuff like that. And, and Plutarch made it very clear that he wasn't a good person. So I think much of, he really does praise Spartacus' nobility, but I think he's contrasting it with Crassus. All right. Thank you. Uh, and, so uh, it's weird and complicated. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Howard. Um, Beverly, uh, you're up. Beverly? Beverly? Yep, how to unmute myself. Good afternoon, everyone. So slavery had been part of the ancient world uh, before uh, the Romans became involved. Slavery, I think the earliest records of slavery go back to the Sumerians. And slavery in Rome was just a continuation of um, slavery in uh, Greece. And in fact, um, most of, and that was due to the numerous wars between Rome and Greece and the Roman victories. War captives weren't the only slaves in Rome. And even Romans themselves could be uh, enslaved. The stranger fact is that they could voluntarily turn themselves into slaves. Um, here, of course, is uh, uh, a list of the ways of how one became a slave. Um, and slavery was just a common attribute of the ancient world. There was no distinction between um, where slaves had come from, uh, when one was a slave, color did not matter. Um, so as you can see here, um, the worst, life for a slave would be that of a criminal who was taken into slavery. And those um, men, and actually, um, I shouldn't even say men because many of them didn't even live beyond the age of 18, were uh, slaves in the mines and the conditions there were horrific. And as I said, most of them were dead by the time they were in their late teens. Um, you then had slaves here as dead enslaved men uh, falling behind on one's rent that was leased from the landowner. However, if there was a way to earn some money, one could by himself out of slavery. Uh, the chattel slaves were owned by, mas by masters and seen as possession, uh, possessions, but actually house slaves um, could have, um, although the idea and the practice of slavery is abhorrent, House slaves often led uh, fairly uh, decent lives. Um, and in many cases, um, for example, there uh, women who were widowed 
uh, and highly educated or educated but widowed uh, were often taken in as prostitutes. And so a man could have his wife and also a prostitute who he would, because she was educated, could in fact discuss uh, literature and uh, uh, poetry. Um, and, and so it says here, both male and female slaves, the prostitutes had the uh, option to work in brothels, but also offered their services on the streets. And here is what I've been talking about, the high, high class uh, prostitutes. And they were called female companions, uh, a well-educated talents in the arts, but what distinguished them was the fact that they were widows. And then you had the demo D, the public slaves who were owned by the state and worked for, actually they were civil servants. Uh, they worked as clerks road on roads and they even tutored. Um, all were though denied civic rights and disqualified from participating in politics. And of course, Roman society was um, very defined. Uh, and so it was almost impossible to move from one social class to another. Uh, slaves that were acquired through battle uh, and warfare were um, sold at marketplaces, often near uh, waterfronts. Um, captives were brought back as war booty, sold to traders, and, and that was a job in and of itself, was to be a slave, actually a slave trader. The most notable, <coughs> excuse me, the most notable of all, uh, all slave owners was in fact Julius Caesar. Uh, after his conquest of Gaul in, I think the 50s BC, uh, he brought back um, 400 slaves that he kept as his own. Um, let's see, owning slaves was a birthright for Romans and there was no limit. Wealthy people could have hundreds of them. The prefect of Rome under Emperor Nero had at least 400 in his townhouse. Um, only the senators, maybe only the senators had about 200,000, which makes the number of slaves and free people easily equal to one another. Cost of a slave varied according to his or her looks, age, education, and ethnicity being uh, from what the most coveted slaves were those of, uh, uh, or Greeks, because they were uh, educated unlike um, slaves from barbarian places. Uh, if one purchased a slave and it was discovered that there was a physical problem, uh, such as uh, epilepsy, uh, they could they could be returned, and one would get back uh, the money he had paid. Uh, and there were absolutely no rules on how slaves should be treated. Uh, while many state, well, while statesmen 
spoke about how wrong slavery was, nevertheless, it did not preclude them from having slaves. Uh, and here is how an example of an, um, a painting of a slave market in ancient Rome. Um, and I would assume where it says some slaves stood naked, um, oftentimes, of course, it was women. Um, here's debt slavery. Uh, within the Roman legal system, it was a form of emancipation. And emancipation, and this was um, uh, a man would pledge himself as a bond slave, uh, and would put up uh, collateral, and that might even be his own son, um, and. Romans, although they may have had Roman citizens as slaves, they were uh, not supposed to be uh, punished, uh, corporally punished. There was also uh, something called manumission, and that was the ability uh, to be freed, for a Roman slave to be freed. And this was done under uh, the legal system by a magistrate. Right, and again, a slave has no persona. A slave is not a person. He doesn't own his body. He's not a per, does, has no personality. He is in fact, or she, um, as the, educated house slave, um, you were a non-person, you were um, devoid of any individuality at all. And here, of course, at the bottom is this uh, relief uh, showing a Roman soldier leading captives, uh, captive in in chains. Um, and then this goes on to the three slave, res uh, uh, slave result, slave revolts, uh, and they were called the servile wars, um, slave, war, uh, slave wars. The first one was uh, in Sicily, and here it was led by a slave from Syria. Um, the uprising was mostly called by great changes in land ownership, an overabundance of slaves, lack of food, and cruel treatment led them to the uprising. Uh, thank you, Beverly. Uh, um, this was really incredible. Thank you. And again, the, but if you wanted to see the full presentation on slave uh, from Beverly, please do visit our History Fitness Investing or History Fitness Philosophy YouTube channel. And she has a full two hour, um, you know, uh, 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 presentation on it. I just wanted to mention something about the second Servile War, and we'll obviously we'll come to the third one, which is Spartacus. The second one was actually ran by consular, and everybody knows him as Gaius Marius, right? Uh, who basically re he was recruited eventually successful to uh, to do a successful war against Siampri in and in, in Gaul, uh, Cisalpine war, Gaul, which is the basically Gaul was a where current. Um, France and, uh, and Spain is, and we'll get into a map in a second. And then, so what happens is, uh, to make a long story short, uh, Mary's decreed that any allied friendly Italian should be released if they were in Roman slavery, okay? So basically they released all these Italians, but what about non-Italians, you know, like that were, were seeking, um, so there was about 800 of slaves that were not Italians that basically revolted because uh, they did not agree with the fact that 
uh, they were not released. Okay. And then um, one question to you, Beverly. So in regard to uh, Spartacus, is there any accounts of him being a slave prior to being a gladiator? How was his, how was he treated in Ludus or in the, uh, um, in this by Badiatis? So was there any kind of accounts by Plutarch or, uh, uh, or maybe we, there might be more a Howard question later on. Um, do you know any of this stuff? Sorry. I don't, I don't remember reading anything about uh, Plutarch, uh, Plutarch making comments about Spartacus specifically. I did read about Plutarch's, uh, uh, what he wrote about slavery. And it's what I said earlier that it was looked upon harshly and unfairly, but in fact, it was do as I say, not as I do. Um, Spartacus, and this is only speculation that he had um, excellent leadership skills because he was the one who led um, 70 of his uh, uh, fellow gladiators uh, through the kitchen, may I say, of the place where they were living, because the kitchen is where weapons um, were kept. And so as someone who laid, led uh, the initial um, slave rebellion, which grew and grew. Um, I don't know what Plutarch said, but that had to have been impressive to uh, to the people who were of high status in um, Greece and even in Rome. Uh, that's amazing. Thank you so much uh, for this addition. Appreciate it. Let me just thank you. Uh, thank you. Move on. So now Spartacus is a slave. He gets to Kappa with Ludus by Badiatis. And then in about a you know, couple of minutes, I'll, I'll let Howard speak about him being a, a gladiator. But this is how the Ludus in Capua uh, would look. And, um, and I wanted to play a small video of the um, second, uh, basically, uh, a Legos uh, presentation of the uh, Ludus. Uh, so bear with me a second. Before I let uh, uh, Howard, before I let Howard speak, let me just talk about 
um, Spartacus himself. So um, we really don't have a lot of accounts of Spartacus being his gladiator, but um, in a second, how we talk about uh, different kind of gladiators. But apparently he was assumed to be a Murmillo, who is Murmillo as a heavyweight gladiator, basically. If you have a boxing fighters right now, you have heavyweight fighter, um, you know, uh, for example, uh, you know, Tyson Fury, then you'll be a heavyweight, um, you know, a gladiator. And so basically he would be exactly the Hollywood type favorite for the movies, you know, uh, uh, you know, easy eye candy, so to speak. So Mar Marmillo wore a full uh, bronze helmet and heavy arm, uh, leg or shoulder guards. However, he kept his chest bare, which often allowed warriors to display the tattoos uh, in battle scars that accrued over the years. The gladiators typically wielded a large shield called scutum and a straight uh, broadsword. Although Spartacus had always been depicted in the movies and TV uh, shows, um, you know, uh, obviously Douglas would be one of them, uh, TV shows as a, a prestigious fighter, we actually do not know anything about his success in the arena. Since these battles are usually to the death, he was presumably skilled enough to survive until upcoming our, uh, uprising started, or he was convincing enough for crowd to spare him. Uh, remember, you know, you know, finger, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, even though he lost. So without further ado, I'll let um, Howard speak. Go ahead. Hi. Okay. I did the presentation last year on gladiators. Um, I think the first thing we need to wrap our head around is just the passage of time. And the point I made is that Rome went from a, from a a legendary monarchy, then they became a republic. The republic became powerful and expanded empire, and then things fell apart and were protracted civil war, and then it collapsed, and you had the principate. You had the 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 Romans ruled by Gaius Octavian, uh, who took on the title of princeps, and he pretended it was a republic, but it wasn't. It was it had become a monarchy under the emperors, which is about 69 to about 180 CE, you had more and more power concentrated in the hands of the emperors themselves. You had the third century crisis where everything collapsed with, with the accession of Commodus. Um, and then from the, from the fourth century on, you had the dominant when it was an absolute monarchy. So in the case of this affects how the political system works, it affects the economy, it affects where your slaves come from, and and Spartacus is in the middle of the of, of the of the Republican civil. We, Spartacus is in the middle of the Republican civil wars. Probably the important transition of the gladiator during the civil wars. Rome was militarily active throughout this period. They were constantly waging campaigns and bringing home slaves, and slaves were cheap. Um, it, your your slaves coming home were cheap, and they had military training, so it was a relatively easy matter to send them out, hand them a sword and send them out the arena and have them, have them fight somebody to the death. If the slave is killed, you're not out for much money. It's not very expensive. Um, once we get, once we get into the imperial period when they're not waging these wars, the slaves become far more expensive. The spectacle becomes way more elaborate. I think the, the Murmillo, for example, was expected to fight in a certain way. And we don't want, we don't know what that way was, um, but they were, Less willing to kill the, the, the slave. Once the slaves get expensive, you're less willing to kill them, and, and the and the combat seems to have been more survivable in the first century A.D. Um, now, gladiator combat actually seems to have evolved out of human sacrifice ceremonies. When your when your dad died, if your important man died, so they they executed a couple of slaves in his memory to show his power of life or death. And at some point, somebody decided to have the two people slaves fight to the death. The um, system became more um the, the the process became more elaborate it was generally assumed that slaves would be killed off but Livy describes uh Scipio were, uh, says he returned to New Carthage sometime in Spain and he held a gladiator and he held a festival and he held gladiator combat and the Spanish volunteered to participate now in his description he describes two guys named Corbus and Orsuba who were first cousins and they were distributing disputing the, the control over a city and they made it clear they're going to fight to the death they, they they didn't didn't care they didn't care any human thought they didn't care any god thought other than mars they're going to fight one of them was going to die and the other guy was going to rule the city that tells me that most of the other gladiators expected to survive the battle 
It's that's not clear, but it sounds like it was. And Scipio tried to reason with these two guys. You know, this is dumb. Why not just talk to each other or hold a vote or something? But as far as we can see, the, the older guy killed the younger one in the end. So get, he got the rule of cities. Um, by, as I know, by about 70 BC, there's, there are lots of combat. If I'm going to hold a gladiator festival, I need expendable slaves. Um, I've got lots of Gauls. The Gauls fought with each other quite happily if the Romans weren't around. So it would be no problem putting two Gauls out in the arena that are willing to kill each other. Um, the Thracians were pretty chaotic. So I'm sure the Thracians would fight with each other. And there's no problem Thracians and Gauls fighting. And these are warriors. You dying in the, you know, dying in battle is honorable. Uh, working in the farm fields is not honorable. Or dying or working in a mine. Either way, you're dead. So we don't know how dangerous it was. Um, the word train, the word school is used. I'm I'm looking through two translations of Plutarch and two translations of of Appian, and, and the only one of them is the word school used. Uh, another one that talked about training the gladiators. So we don't know how rigorous the training was. According to Appian, um, Spartacus was a had been in the Roman army, so he had basic military. He had basic military training. He knew what to do with the gladiators. Other than that, that's probably about it. I think the the classes of gladiators is something that kicked in, became came in later, and became more elaborate. They probably hadn't got to that stage by this time. In other words, if you wanted, it was a Gaul in the arena. He probably was a Gaul, and he very likely was using his own Gaulish, his just own Gaulish weapons were handed back to him as he stepped out there. There was a, there was an understanding in the ancient world that you bravely accepted your fate. I think in my presentation I mentioned the the Aesop's fable about a deer, a one-eyed deer, eating, uh, who positioned herself on a hill where a good eye could uh, see the land where the hunters were, and the hunters got a boat, came out of from the sea, shot her and killed her, and she died. She said, "Ah, oh, I cannot escape your fate." Th th this was a mindset that would help you send people in the arena as gladiators. Excellent. Thank you, Howard. Appreciate it. Uh, so, you know, obviously he's in this gladiator school. Uh, and as I have, Howard had mentioned, we don't have much of the account from both uh, Api and, and Plutarch. And um, so they're plotting, uh, and apparently the, the revolt breaks out. Uh, initially, uh, the mention was about 200 of them um, had started to revolt at the start of the uprising. And what's happening is 200 of them revolted, but it failed initially, and only 78 uh, escapes, basically going through kitchens, you know, picking up utensils wherever they can, and arming themselves with the, with that, and uh, defeating guards, uh, and and basically took a run for it, right, out of the school, gladiator school. During the escape, they ran into the carts full of the gladiator weapons, being sent to another city. Uh, so. Romans messed up, left the carts of weapons, which they, you know, plundered obviously and took the, you know, wagons of arm and armed themselves properly, right? So in ancient Rome to that time, there was only two escapes uh, prior to that, that, and both of them failed. So three escapes in total, only one gladiator escape that, you know, slave escape that survived uh, is this one. And so the former slave decided to seek refuge on the Mount of Vesuvius. I mean, Vesuvius prior to that did not was not a ready uh, volcano. It didn't erupt, uh, and therefore, you know, they were able to hide there, which offered a stronger defense position. On their way, uh, they recruited other slaves. So everybody heard obviously about the uh, the slavery war, and who makes the best uh, warriors? Believe it or not, shepherds, right? Because they're free. They let. The owners let shepherds, slaves do anything they want, right? I mean, they kind of, you know, they can hold a little bit of weapons. They can go out there in the field and herd the, uh, you know, the, the sheep or whatever it is. And therefore, they made the best. So he's right next to Vesuvius, all this land uh, with shepherds. They're all joining him. And uh, obviously, so they, um, uh, initially, they overwhelmed whatever the militia that was nearby, right? So ancient Rome, uh, ancient Rome sources never mention what Spartacus did to convince other slaves uh, that he was a leader, right? Um, 
basically uh, one factor that played the part is the fact that the men split their plunder equally. So one thing he did is he said, whenever we will, you know, the slaves will obviously plunder anything, they will just share it equally. And that's how you won their, uh, apparently, assumption is how you won the fact that he became a leader. All right. So uh, the other two leaders uh, that were with him, believe it or not, they actually goals. Uh, but there's also an interesting aspect. Nobody really knows. I mean, we're thinking they're goals. In the movies that are portrayed, Crixus is a goal. And Ananias, this is how you pronounce it, it's another leader. Uh, he's actually um, uh, from the over the Rhine, and he is considered to be Germanic tribe. But uh, Anemius and, and Crixus is mentioned by uh, Plutarch as, as goals. But if you think of it, their names do not suggest their uh, goals. For example, Crixus, which we're trying to obviously uh, break the, uh, the myth uh, that Plutarch you know, might have wrote it incorrectly, that Crixus actually is from the tribe um, that's called OSK, which is in, in Italy, and they call them Osks. And, um, and Animaeus is, is a Greek name. So they're not Gauls. Uh, they're not, you know, uh, from over the Rhine and Germanic. They're actually Greek and Italian. Uh, well, I, I, or what we think, or also Appian, for example, referred to them as uh, subordinate to Spartacus. They were not his equal. Uh, somebody had a question. Let me see. Uh, some of Southern Spain was earliest known to the nation, 6th and 5th millennium BC, that thought to be a birthplace of slavery, culture required need for workers. Okay, thank you. All right, so continuing. So this is, we'll call them a triumvirate of uh, slavery. Uh, I mean, of slavery wall is uh, Crixus, Anemius, and Spartacus escaped to Vesuvius. Yeah. So uh, at Vesuvius, basically, um, uh, Mount Vesuvius, which I'll go next in a second. A battle of Mount Vesuvius, it is a fair to say that when Roman Senate heard about Spartacus and his little uprising, they did not take it seriously. As I've mentioned, it is considered to be a bad thing to fight uh, a slave. Uh, even if you win, you lose. Even if you lose, you lose double, basically. So if you're a senator or a counselor, and you go to fight a slave, they consider to be, um, you know, subpar humans, and therefore, at some in, in some cases, they consider to be a property. So they, it was not. There's no win-win situation. So they kind of send a couple of cohorts uh, with uh, the um, I mentioned with, uh, um, um, and I'll, I'll mention his name again. But um, so basically, what's happening? And we may mock them uh, for now, but back then. Uh, this made some sense. Rome has quite a few other problems on its hands, right? So Rome is fighting other wars, right? They have a, a war with Quintus Sertorius. Uh, so the Quis um, uh, Quintus Sertorius. So remember, we mentioned a war between Sulla uh, and Marius, and uh, Quintus Sertorius was actually a supporter of uh, uh, Marius and lost the war, but ended up uh, uh, staying in uh, Gaul, uh, in Iberian Peninsula, and revolted against Sulla. And therefore, initial thought was, okay, um, Spartacus wants to break out. He's being helped by the, remember, his troops are not just being joined by slaves. They're free men that are joining him. But they also, what's interesting, they're joining him but there's also, it seems to be somebody's helping him. And they're thinking it's Sertorius from Iberian Peninsula, from Gaul, is helping him and wants to reconnect. After the civil war, Italy is, or Rome is broken and they want to connect and therefore create a new rule. So it's not a really slavery wall. That's why we're trying to, you know, uh, kind of burst the bubble in this case. And um, so basically who was Sertorius? A former Roman statesman who chose the losing side during this uh, second civil war of Rome, the Republic, but refused to concede defeat. Over the Asia Minor, Rome also fought another war. Right during that time, they were fighting the Mitridatic War, where basically they ended the kingdom of Pontus, uh, led by Mitridates. Um, and there were several wars that they fought against Mitridates. 
So eventually resulted in a decisive victory for Rome, the, uh, the war again in, in breaking up Pontic Empire. But at the same time, they, they can't fight three wars. So they thought this was just a small skirmish. It'll get suppressed at some point. But not until 10, uh, so it took him 10 years to suppress uh, Mitradites. So as you can see, Rome had its plate full. Therefore, the revolt of the gladiators was dismissed as nothing more than a crime wave that could be solved with a cohort of two. What is a cohort? It's 500, basically 500 legionnaires, 500 soldiers in a cohort, right? And if you have a legion, it's about 3,000 to 6,000 soldiers. In charge of this force was a praetor named uh, Gaius Claudius Glaber, okay? Of which we may almost know nothing. Well, it, you know, it's, it's considered that he was, you know, um, basically uh, uh, close to Claudian family, but he was not. Claudian family, as we know, he had descendants of Jupiter and, uh, um, and, and therefore uh, Caesar was uh, uh, from the Claudian family. But really he was not. And after he gets defeated, nobody really hears about him anymore. So he's never mentioned again whether this means he died in battle or he never did anything else of no. We just don't know about this guy, uh, um, Glauber. Anyway, Glauber army consisted of approximately 3,000 militia. They were not, you know, legionnaires. They were basically hastily uh, gathered militia that, you know, uh, not a proper Roman legionnaires because they fought Mitrodidas and Sertorius in Gaul, Mitrodidas and Bosphorus. They don't have time for this fight. Again, the fact that the Senate sent an approval military commander leading the untrained militia revealed how little they were concerned with uprising, okay? So this is Mount uh, Vesuvius. Glauber uh, and his units chased gladiators to their camp on Mount Vesuvius and laid siege on the only road down the mountain. So this Glauber is completely doesn't understand the, the war logic or, tech, you know, um, and basically decides to trap in a mountain, right? Uh, his plan was to simply wait insurgents to starve to death. Um, very unoriginal idea, basically. Sarkis did not have this problem. In fact, his side deployed a much more novel game plan. So Spartacus, now you think he's a, he was a slave, right? Prior to that, he was a nomad, maybe served a little bit for auxiliary for Rome. How, how, how come he was so smart? They're thinking that he really was that extraordinary. So anyway, um, you know, uh, he knew that Glauber was only paying attention to the side with a descent because of the other consider of the steep cliff, which seemingly impossible. So you just covered the side with a descent and the other one was steep, he didn't really cover. However, he and his men made rope ladders with Spartacus out of wild wines, that were plentiful in the area and repelled down undetected by the Romans. They then surrounded Glauber's camp and easily defeated his forces in the surprise attack. In the end, all this expedition managed to do was to supply the rebels with much needed ammunition and armor to help bolster their numbers as more people heard of their exploits. Um, so I just wanna show the uh, depiction on Quintus Sertorius, who almost defeated Rome in the uh, um, in Iberian Peninsula in Gaul, and he was a supporter of Marius during the Civil War, and thought of helping Spartacus during this um, fight. Any questions before we move on? No questions. Okay. Uh, did I put everybody to sleep? <laughs> no. All right. Second expedition. All right, we're coming to the good part, guys. One second. Uh, second expedition, uh, basically Rome now recognizes that Glauber is defeated. It's a small militia army. Uh, so they sent somebody who's called Verinius, who is actually, you know, a uh, uh, counselor, right? Um, obviously there is really no juicy detail to mention about Verinius. Uh, just the fact that the Spartacus Trump, Trump triumphed over him. They first defeated one of the Praetor's lieutenants named Furius, who had 2,000 soldiers with him. Then another Praetor called Cassinius, who had been sent out of another large force to offer support to Verinius. 
And the most notable piece is that he was, you know, uh, Verinius was almost taken as a prisoner by his surgeons as gladiators caught his camp of guard. Finally, they defeated Verinius, and Spartacus, the symbol of victory, took his horse. Now the Spartacus raided the country, countryside more and more. Remember, he went out after the, um, the uh, uh, certain type of people. They were, you know, almost free men, joined his ranks, and the army boasted 70,000 troops. Presumably, Emmaus, who was one of his soldiers, had already died by that time. And then uh, we, we're coming to the point of Rix's death. So now um, we're kind of going forward, uh, and I'm going to explain how the Crixus die, which is a, a third person in the revolt. Uh, according to Plutarch, Spartacus wanted to traverse the Alps. No, he wants to cross the Alps. Remember who is another person prior to him cross the Alps was Hannibal, right? Uh, Hannibal, the Carthage. Um, general from Carthage, who was raised in uh, Gaul and um, and therefore uh, attacked Rome at one point, defeated eighty thousand uh, soldiers in one fight by Khan using the formation uh, 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 lunar formation depicted in a. If you guys watch Game of Thrones in the Battle of Bastards, perfectly. So according to Plutarch. Uh, Sparta wanted to travel in Arabs and escape Roman territory. So now he wants to escape. He defeated two armies. He defeated the praetor, two praetors, Varinius, Glauber. And now in his view, Thracians planned to disband the army while they had secured freedom. However, Spartacus could, could not convince his men and were feeling cocky now that they were wanting to continue raiding. So now they see that they're cocky and they want to continue raiding. And they were Italian, uh, so it's, it's pretty plentiful. Other sources claim that the plan was and had always been to march to Rome. So Spartacus initially wanted to run them. The notion that there was some dissension in the ranks regarding their next move was strengthened by the fact that at one point rebels split into two armies, Spartacus and Crixus. We don't know if that was strategic or it was disagreement. So which led to Crixus's death, basically. So this is... Uh, uh, one of the fights from the movie where they show Crixus, you know, uh, mistakenly in the movie, it shows Crixus attacking the role, but it actually never happened. Um, and I'll explain. The death of Crixus uh, by this point, the Senate realized that the little uprising caused by the escaped slave was no laughing matter. It was only growing in power. This was embarrassing for all. In 72 BC, it tasked two consulars, uh, uh, Gallus and Lentulus, to put an end to the uprising. Now they're sending two counselors uh, who basically are given the wartime uh, rule to put down this revolt. So they're taking it seriously. A typical legion was about 4,000 in infantry and a few hundred cavalry. So you can think, you know, there was about 6,000 troops that he was ready to attack on. But what is a Roman? It's a well-oiled machine, right? We have people that have trained and, you know, basically fought together. But this is the army that, uh, new recruits. They, they haven't trained together. Uh, ones are fighting in Mitridates, in Bosphorus, another one's fighting uh, Sertorius. So uh, all, the, all the seasoned soldiers were busy. So no matter how many men Rome had, there were still vastly outnumbered by the insurgent forces. However, Roman had superior equipment and strict code and good training. Uh, because the two main sources, Plutarch and Appian, give different accounts of the battle between Spartacus and the consular armies. They do not necessarily contradict each other, but they each mention events that the other ignores. As stated before, the rebel forces split into two armies. Both history agree that uh, Gallius and his legion fought Crixus, who command about 30,000 uh, men near Mount Garganus. This encounter resulted in a decisive victory for all. This is where the Crixus dies. The rebel, the rebel army lost around two thirds of its troops, including Crixus, who was killed in the battle. When Spartacus hears about Crixus' death, he basically just goes and sacrifices 300 Roman soldiers in his honor that are sitting as his prisoners. Fighting consular armies, both sources also agree that Spartacus and the main insurgent forces faced the army of Lentulus while heading the uh, Cisalpine goal and triumphed. So now Spartacus defeated the other army led by Lentulus. 
Uh, and afterwards they started to defer. Okay, so where do they defer? Okay, let me just admit people. All right, so remember, the reason they, the Appian and, and Plutarch defer, they wrote this works about the war of Spartacus and the life of Crassus uh, 150 years after this happened. So what, what, what was different? According to the Appian, Gallius, which is one of the consular, and his men headed towards Spartacus after defeating Crixus. So after defeating Crixus, Gallius decides to turn and they want to encircle Spartacus. His hope was that he would reach Spartacan army in time and trap between the two legions commanded by him and Lentulus. So two consulars attacking Rome. He was too late though, as the Thracian, the Spartacus, had time to best the other consular, turn his soldiers around and defeat Gallius in combat also. So that, that was a mistake. And this, you know, this is where it happened basically. So, um, Basically, uh, the counselors, whoever was left, had retreated and they united in single army, made the attempt against Spartacus. So whatever, whoever is left, basically retreated back to Rome. They went back to Rome, which is right here, and um, decided to challenge Spartacus and Ficinium, which is right here. So uh, Plutarch makes no mention of Spartacus fight against Gallius, or Battle of Piscinius against both counselors. So Blutarch don't mention his Appian writing about the counselor fight. Instead, he said he had engaged, engages the combat with the army of governor of Cecilpine Gaul, Sisius Longinus. There's also some confusion to what happened after the defeated two counselor armies. While Plutarch offers no concrete information, Appian more or less places Spartacus to war path to Rome. Now Spartacus is going to Rome after defeating the consular army. Maybe it was the death of Crixus, or maybe he thought that himself invisible to battle, but Spartacus seemed to determine to um, pelify mighty Rome, basically pillage the Rome. Maybe it was, you know, um, he marched uh, to the capital with 120,000 troops, okay? But, Instead, decides to take over the town called Thuri. Uh, if you would look at this map, um, it's right here. Thuri is right here, okay? So if you go by the bigger map, uh, uh, basically he went from Pacinium to uh, Thuri and he takes over the town. And I wanna play a little clip of, this is actually not him taking over the town, but there's a Roman reclaiming the towns after defeating uh, uh, Spartacus in, in Rome, once, in Thury. Let me play this clip. Oh, one second. Sorry, just too much foul language. Okay, so now we come to the point where Spartacus defeated two counselors, two praetors, Glauber, and now um, Rome is basically is saying it's enough. So they select um, uh, a senator, and his name is Crassus, uh, uh, Licinius Crassus. And I want to play a little clip to show you who was, um, how ruthless was this senator. Basically, um, Spartacan rebellion was anything else uh, than a major threat to the endanger the Roman itself. It gave the task of putting down the uprising once and for all for, to Marcus Licinius Crassus. And I'm playing the next clip to show you how ruthless he was. And he was um, as savagery, um, if not more savagery than, uh, than Spartacus. So this is um, basically playing by uh, actor Norton uh, and he's challenging the gladiator uh, um, uh, to a fight in his villa. Crosses. <laughs> You asked me to kill you. I 
command you to try. Then you command my death. If you're victorious, it'll be at the cost of my life. If you fall to my sword, my life is equally forfeit. A man's true enemy is thou. The thing I would not carry into battle against Spartacus. Your will, Dominus. My hands. <laughs> So you get a you get a you get a point of uh, Crassus. So who was Crassus? So Crassus, remember today, is one of the first oligarchs of Rome. Uh, he was the richest man of Rome, and he had about, you, if you think of it, twenty billion dollars in today's value, uh, and it was measured in two hundred million sesterti. Plutarch used the gold talent to qualify Crassus' wealth and placed it at over. 7,100 talent, which would mean that the modern terms, 213 metric of ton of gold. That's how much gold he had. How did he ac acquire his uh, uh, wealth? Cross's fortune came from a fire and war, making public calamities his greatest source of revenue, as Plutarch's put it. Some of his lucrative businesses included a fire department that arrived at the burning home and only extinguished the flames if they negotiate a generous bargain with the owner. So the, the, the house is burning and he's negotiating a bargain with it. Otherwise, the men simply looked at the house being burned to the ground. Afterwards, Cross is even offered to buy the property at a significantly reduced price, of course. Another one of the schemes was the school of slaves. By taking cheap and unskilled labor, um, unskilled labor and giving them a training, and he increased their value significantly and then sold them for a TD profit. A bulk of Cross's wealth came from real estate during the war with uh, Sola and Marius. He supported Sola and therefore he was able to buy properties uh, for all virtually nothing for the defected uh, bureaucracy. Um, basically, uh, I've just mentioned that. Okay, and this, this picture has already been uh, described. So what, the, what does Crassus do? Uh, Crassus wants to engage, um, you know, he, he pays for his own army and then he wants to engage uh, uh, Spartacus. So while Crassus, Balvia's army waited for Spartacus, uh, the borders of Piscinium, which we already showed, he sent his legate, legate, Mumius, which is right here, who actually didn't wait for him. And he attacked Crassus. Um, and so, he attacked Crassus, he loses. Uh, he attacked, sorry, Spartacus, and he loses. Uh, so Spartacus um, is triumphant. So now he thinks that the Crassus is weak because he sent his understudy, and therefore, um, you know, it's a problem. So what does what does Crassus do? He does something that's called decimation. Okay. So it was an old um, uh, 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 process that would take. Uh, one of every uh, cohort uh, uh, member, which could be up to 500 people in the Legion, um, and basically uh, kill uh, the people within the Legion have to kill that person. They, they draw lots. And if you pick up the, uh, the lot that we're supposed to die, the, your friends from your, lead, you know, from your cohort are supposed to kill you, basically. And that's how he was able to prove that you cannot escape Spartacus um, during during the battle, and he is more vicious than Spartacus in that in that regard. So uh, and Appian, however, believe it, uh, it was easier for two council legion for his entire army uh, after the defeat. So it was easier to do this decimation than do anything else. So it made a big difference, obviously. Uh, so this tactic seemed to work. Crassus provided he was more dangerous than the enemy using decimation. So uh, let's move on. All right. So now uh, Crassus and Spartacus meet, and Crassus wins the first skirmish. It wasn't really a big skirmish, and Spartacus retreats to Lucania. Okay. And then he retreats further to Regnum. So Crassus didn't underestimate his foe. He built fortification across the isthmus, which is after the retreated. 
isthmus and to the peninsula that the rebels would cut off from any provision. So basically, right now we are at this, um, uh, you know, uh, Strait uh, and Masana, and uh, after retreating to uh, Lucania, uh, you know, crosses in traps Spartacus. And instead, the tactics split the rebellious fighters into two groups. One of them broke through the siege and started their own raiding campaign. Crosses fell upon them swiftly and destroyed in the battle. So he was picking them up pieces by pieces. Although, after destroying the first uh, part of the uh, uh, you know, Spartacus army, he actually saw, after killing 12,000 people, 12,000 insurgents, there was only two of them that were actually killed from the back. They were stabbed in the back. So therefore, everybody was facing the Roman army and they were, you know, you know, therefore they were considered to be, uh, um, you know, they were considered to be warriors even when they were slaves. Crassus sent another army with his officer named Quantus to pursue Spartacus forces, which fled the mountains, basically. He's fleeing the mountains and he's pursuing him. Um, uh, the gladiator turned his troops around and met the Romans in the battle uh, and was triumphant. So one of the uh, um, Crassus's uh, uh, praetors were uh, defeated, basically. Um, and so now, uh, um, you know, uh, Spartacus is bolstered by the victory um, and wanted to engage Crassus directly. Uh, but so the Rome is scared that the revolt might continue. So they asked Pompey, who remember is fighting Sertorius in Iberian Peninsula, and they asked Pompey and uh, Lucullus to come and help Crassus to destroy uh, Spartacus. So Crassus is scared now, and he's fighting against the clock to get all the glory and be triumphant and uh, come back as a counselor that get a triumph, uh, triumph in, in Rome. Um, so let's just go on. Um, I just wanted to read this from uh, Battle, uh, you know, this was by Blue Plutarch, which is a Spartacus final stand. Uh, the pushing his way uh, toward Crassus himself through many flying weapons in wooden men, Spartacus did not indeed reach, but slew two Sertarians who fell upon him together. Finally, after his companions had taken to flight, he stood alone, surrounded by his foes and was still defending himself when he was cut down. So we're talking about Spartacus in the final battle attacking uh, Crassus. And let's talk about the final battle. So now Pompey is rushing down to get a triumph and basically cut down Spartacus from his side. And also another commander, Lucullus, is now wants to rip the glory. But uh, Crassus don't want any of this. He wants to defeat Spartacus by himself. So what happens is, uh, this is Pompey, as I was saying, uh, he defeated Sertorius uh, in the Iberian Peninsula in Gaul and became triumphant. Uh, and so now um, uh, the armies meet at the river of Silurius River um, and battle takes place in Silurius River. There's not that many accounts of the battle, but they say about 36,000 uh, died in battle, 6,000 captured and was obviously uh, you know, um, they did what, what they did. And Pompey killed about 5,000 fleeing. Uh, so after the Crosses defeated uh, Spartacus and 36,000 people died, 6,000 of them was crucified and 5,000 were fleeing and Pompey would cut them down and they were fleeing because Crosses uh, uh, was the one that actually defeated. But when they came back to Rome, the, uh, the triumph was declared by Pompey, not Crosses because he was able to, he was much more um, decorated sold, you know, general than Crassus, and they believe that he is the one to defeat Spartacus. And this is the first triumvirate. We're talking about uh, Crassus, Pompey, and Caesar. Caesar was not participant in this at all. Now, fate of Spartacus. I remember I read the Plutarch. So Spartacus was killed in a battle, killed by a known soldier. Plutarch claimed that during the battle, Sparta cut his way through the enemy ranks, which I've said, and tried to reach Crassus himself, but was stopped when two dead centurions fell upon him. He was then completely surrounded and cut down 
while fighting to the bitter end. Okay, social impact. The third servile uh, war was the largest slave revolt in the ancient world, devastating much of the Southern Italy and towns. Many landlords were forced to free their slaves as a consequence of bankruptcy, impact of Spartacus, you know, and according to dailyhistorian.org. Changed the social attitude towards slavery, now seen more of human beings rather than uh, objects. Conclusion, there were many factors in Spartacus' life that uh, instigated his impact and influences. Initially caused no concern in the Roman public, however, did later have an impact on the Roman government. Did have a strong impact on Rome, however, predominantly significant in terms of the slavery, freedom, and then government oppression. All right, uh, let me read, there's I think some questions and then, all right. Oh, this is almost barely. Any, any questions from you guys? Anyone, any, uh, I, I can unmute everybody. And if you have any questions, you let me know. Uh, Howard, Beverly, you have anything to add? Not a whole lot. The social, imp the, the, I'm, I'm fascinated with the historical impact of, Spart of Spartacus. I'm assuming this all comes from communist countries. You had a series, when the Romans Republic ended, everybody between there and the 18th century was basically authoritarian and, and peasants were expected, and, and slaves and peasants were expected to do what they were told. So you didn't idolize the people who led the revolts. Um, you notice that, for example, in, um, in Dante's Inferno, the deepest depths of hell are occupied by Brutus and Lucullus, who are, who are traitors to Julius Caesar, uh, whereas we 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 are today we interpret these guys as trying to save the Roman Roman Republic. Uh, the Caesar was the traitor, and of course we hit the American Revolution when we finally got a revolution going on. But most of the American founding fathers owned slaves. Uh, slave revolts are bad, are, are continuing to be bad. You really don't. I don't think Sparta could become. Yeah, I'm, you're showing a, a drawing from the 19th century of Spartacus and his dying in battle. Um, I was I was looking at that one up and I wasn't able to interpret it. But really, it's not until you get communists coming along that you that you can idolize the guy and come back and say, you know, peasants and slaves are revolting are good, and therefore the gods that lead them are good. And of course, the guy that the the um, the movie Spartacus with Kurt Douglas, written, uh, who the hell wrote that? You, uh, not, well, I don't know. I know the director, uh, Kubik, I think. Um, it was it's Danny Kubrick. Um, damn, I, I, I should be in the. Yeah, he was actually, as you have mentioned, a communist. So was he was one of the Hollywood Ten, I think. Yeah, um, Dalton Trumbo, I think. Correct, and obviously played by Kirk Douglas. Yeah, um, well, of course, anybody played by Kirk Douglas has to be the good guy. <clears throat> so, if anybody wants to speak, I ask uh, people to unmute. Yeah, yeah, I can unmute and talk. Ah, uh, Steve. I've um, I have the, the definitive book on American slavery is Roll Jordan Roll by Eugene Genovese. Um, the slavery in the U.S. was racial. The understanding was the blacks had to be kept and had to be supervised and cared for. Um, and manumission was actively banned. Uh, there was actually this one happened a couple of times. Uh, somebody came up with the idea if, if the Negro slave do something virtuous, they'll be freed. And someone's response to this was the whole point of slavery is that slavery is good for them. That's a condition they should be in. Why, why would you reward, you know, if, if freeing them is a good thing to do, then our whole social system is wrong. Um, their mistake. Hmm? Their, their mistake. Anybody wants to? Uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Who is that? Who is that speaking? Uh, Stephen. Stephen. Yeah. Just want to point out. Uh, I I found this very useful. Uh, Spartacus War by Barry Strauss. Besides Plutarch, he mentions it. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. I I did think it was interesting that they 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 claim not to have. Um, uh, responded to Sparta. They they claimed everything continued, but it does seem to me that the the uh, their system of slavery is a little more nuanced after that. It could also be the lack of uh, mass enslavement uh, because the conquests were more difficult after that. Um, 
but it's a, you you see that a little bit in the uh, in the portrayal of uh, Friedman and of manumission in some of their comedies. Uh, I think of um, um, people being freed uh, in the um, uh, I think um, the character of Trebonius was this very wealthy uh, in uh, um, uh, a very wealthy uh, freedman who becomes very successful, but is always uh, uh, very grateful to his former master. So I think it, it created a system where uh, uh, the slaves had something to hope for. And also weren't uh, weren't gladiators used actually as sort of uh, hired goons by different factions in politics? They weren't, people weren't comfortable. If, if some guy owned 300 gladiators, other people were uncomfortable at that. But then it gets us back to just what legal rights did a gladiator have? Um, if my job is to be sacrificed in the arena, you'd think I'd resent that. Um, so this is, you know, the relationship between the gladiators and their owners is really complicated and we don't understand it. You note that when we move forward to the United States in the 18th century, by the late 18th century, the institution of slavery was being, quest was being questioned on moral grounds. Um, by the 19th century, they worked out the <laughs> slavery good for the Negroes. They liked being slaves. This is their natural state. This is the way it should be. And, and, they, and, and this forced them to kind of behave themselves. Um, the slaves were probably treated in the South better than they were treated in the Caribbean and in Brazil. Um, the way Eugenia Vesey, Eugene Genovese puts it is that the slave owners were no more violent to their slaves than they were to their wives, their kids, and each other. But unfortunately, this was extremely violent. Mm. Now, the Romans, the Romans didn't bring slavery up as a, as a as a moral thing, there was no concept that certain races should be slaves. Um, it, slavery was just something that happened, and it's too bad if it happens to you. And manumission makes sense. I, if, I, if you do certain virtuous things, you work hard for me, and I benefit from it, I manumit you. And my other slaves understand that they will be rewarded if they're good, well behaved. Um, um, I'm wondering if anybody would uh, like to hear um a piece that was actually written by an associate professor of art history who went to Pompeii to um actually unsee um slaves and wrote a wonderful piece on what life was like in Pompeii uh, based on some artifacts that uh, she found. That could be interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Let's, let's read. Your... The other part, uh, how about other participants? Yeah, sure. You can share it if you want. Okay. Her name was Amaka. And her name and footprints are embedded in a terracotta tile belonging to an ancient Roman temple. The sign tile is a rare find because Amica was a Roman slave and her footprint survives. For the most part, the slaves of the well-preserved city of Pompeii still remain largely invisible in history, according to the University of Delaware's Lauren Ackworth Peterson. And I did um, in the chat include a link. Peterson, an associate professor of art history, is exploring new approaches, drawing on literature, law, art, and other material evidence to bring the lives of Pompeii slaves out of the shadows. Uh, she's co-authoring a book that's probably pu published by now because this is 2015. Peterson spoke of countless hours spent in Pompeii walking on the stone streets and narrow sidewalks in the scorching sun of summer, in the rain and the howling wind of winter imagining where the city slaves may have traveled as they carried out their daily work. Who were these slaves? 
Roman slaveholders got them from many places. Some were Greek, yeah. some were African, some were bred in the country specifically for the role. Mount Vesuvius buried Pompeii in 79 AD in a searing avalanche of hot air, volcanic ash, and rock. The city's population has been estimated at 20,000 people near the time of its destruction. Although no one knows exactly how many slaves were in the city, the typical Roman ho household may have had five to seven slaves. In larger houses, such as the impressive House of the Menander, nearly the size of a city block, having many more. Using a map of Pompeii, showing detailed plots of ancient streets and structures, Peterson pointed out the main doors to the houses, which would have been the focus of door watchers inside and the side doors and other spaces of backdoor culture through which as household slaves most likely passed. Slaves might snatch precious time out of their owners and, their, and various slave supervisors site, fetching water at a public fountain, sip it, slipping into a tavern, bakery, or cook shop, race, resting on a masonry bench in the shade of a house a few streets away, lingering in a garden on the south side of the city. In doing so, a slave could become more anonymous and invisible on highly frequented streets. These narrow two-way stone streets would have been noisy and odiferous, filled with donkey carts, human sewage, and animal feces, with slaves carrying the wealthy elite above the mob on litters. Interestingly, uh, a laundry was, uh, urine was collected, and that was how laundry was washed. Slaves were not immediately identifiable by their dress. The simple tunic was the clothing of choice worn by slaves and their owners alike. Only the toga was reserved for Roman citizens. However, many did not wear it because the long length of the material was cumbersome and difficult to keep clean. And here, Urine used as a cleansing agent due to its high ammonia content was collected in jars and taken to the fulleries where clothing was laundered. Slaves yeah. working in the fulleries would stand in small tubs filled with urine, water, and dirty clothes, stomping on them to clean the cloth. Where slaves are more visible in Roman history is in literature and the law because slaves were viewed as property and if they were damaged by an erratic donkey cart or a falling pot flung from an upstairs window, for example, financial retribution would need to be made by the perpetrator. Although some slaves escaped, extensive means of recovering fugitives led to the recapture of many. And often slaves wore necklaces that indicated that they were sl a slave. Peterson said the gruesome remains of slaves shackled in irons, unable to flee Mount Suvius's eruption, were found in a slave prison, prison when the city was evacuated centuries later. Um, and essentially, the rest is um, about her reconstructive work in Pompeii, along with others. Wow. So basically, Pompeii, uh, and you know, was kind of frozen in time, and a lot of the things that you know uh, would be very descriptive, particularly the li life of Rome, and you know, obviously, Ludus, how I was able to play. A Lego construction full of Ludus. This is all construction of the Pompeii uh, <coughs> Ludus and stuff. Um, Long, you have something to say or? Mm -hmm. 
I'm yeah. finished. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you, Beverly. This is this is this is incredible. So, um, any anybody wants to say last words on uh, Spartacus? I mean, to to tell you the truth, there's so much unknown about Spartacus and whether he was in fact, you know, part of the Roman legion. To me, what what really uh, you know stands out is how he was able to defeat one time when um, uh, when Crassus was able to conquer. Uh, and defeat Spartacus. Uh, they found five eagle, uh, five eagles inside, which means he defeated five legions, which is the biggest defeat ever uh, by Romans. I think the the only one that was the uh, that that was a little bit less than that was um, uh, Arminius in um, in Rhine, which is in. Uh, in Germania, and he defeated three Roman legions. So Spartacus defeated five. So he that was the biggest revolt. And therefore, prior to that, he was the only one who made an escape. Everybody else could not even, you know, escape this much. So it's, it seems to me he was helped. What do you guys think about the fact that he was helped by Romans because of the civil war effect? Is there any- the Romans, the Romans were not, I don't think the Romans were good masters. I, I don't think people like being, I question whether people like being ruled by them. Because I think Hannibal lasted a long time as well. And at some point people were putting up, were willing to put up with them. Uh, I, I wonder how good the Romans were at that. Don't forget the Roman military system had changed from the, leg, from the legion of maniples into the legion of cohorts. And that had done, that was left. There were lots of people around who remembered what it was like in the old days. So it's difficult. You know, maybe Crossus was the first guy that showed up with a properly with properly trained forces. Well, Crossus come bankroll uh, the legions and and supply ammunition and weapons himself. Yeah, uh, well, it, it doesn't matter. Crossus was commanding real was, was in command of real. It, it, possibly, what happened there is a Crossus was his command in command of real soldiers. Um, the fact that Spartacus was successful in battle tells us that he had good, solid military experience. So maybe he was in the Roman army. Maybe he did pay attention to what he was doing. So maybe, Howard, you can speak a little bit of history of crosses after what happened. <laughs> um, well, the really important thing about Crossus, um, okay, I, mean, I made the comment, I think the comments there. When you read uh, Plutarch's discussion of crosses, he keeps emphasizing that crosses wasn't, really, wasn't a good, while he was possessed most of the Roman virtues. He, he missed a couple of really critical ones. He was greedy for money and stuff like that. And in general, Plutarch argued that Crassus lacked the proper Roman vir virtues of a gentleman. And I think he comments on, on Spartacus, Spartacus's noble character as a contrast to Crassus. Crassus is, of course, the guy who invaded Parthia and was destroyed by the Parthians with a, with a substantial army. Yeah, and and uh, well, and the Parthians killed him. They they cut his head off, right? And they they cut his head it. off. Yes, <laughs> cut his head off and displayed it in um, as yes. part. Of, yeah. yeah. You know. Um, the Romans were militarily the Romans were wildly aggressive, and that worked most of the time, but it didn't work all of the time. Oh, I see. So what's interesting also, yeah. I have a uh, Mikhail online, and if you want to unmute. Yeah. A uh, particular interest in Spartacus was taken by Stalin, Joseph Stalin. So Joseph Stalin, because of the communist revolution and his Comintero and wanted to expand his revolution uh, toward more of the Western culture, he actually hired several scientists to research this fact. In Western culture, Spartacus wasn't really all that table so Seth could work on the computer. Uh, so, uh, Mikhail, can you comment on that a little bit, or is he around? Okay, I guess he's not. But uh, I remember, Howard, you were mentioning that in Western culture, the Spartacus yeah. wasn't. Go ahead. He doesn't. Well, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know whether it was Stalin, but uh, or somebody else, but uh, this. The sports club Spartak, which was named after Spartacus, it still is present in uh, Russia and previously in Soviet Union. It's a uh, football club and uh, other kinds of club, uh, hockey club. It's all 
it's all there. And uh, we were told on our history lessons about Spartacus. Yes. And well, we I read, I believe, the prevailing book was by Giovannioli, if I remember correctly. Hmm. Well, there was, was a, available in Russia. There was a Spartacus. There was a Spartacus Association in Germany after World War One, and they they were communists and anarchists and stuff like that. Right. When did right. Aram yeah. Kachaturian write his uh, ballet? That's is that nineteen fifties? Ballet. Yeah, there is a ballet. And I believe it was uh, it was uh, performed in the Bolshoi Theater in uh, Moscow. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember who was the main performer. Well, I know in the seventies it was Yusupov, but I don't know if it was earlier. <clears throat> yeah, you see, you guys grew up in communist. I grew up here, and I, grew, I actually did, I did a survey on a on a forum completely unrelated to history, and asked people what their what, where they heard about Spartacus, and everybody said it was the movie. <laughs> uh, you'd have to find somebody about 10 years old, maybe 10 or 20 years older than me uh, to find out. I, I'm going through old history books here trying to find some images. I know to the fact that my copy of, I've got Lord Woodhouse's Universal History here. Um, and this is, uh, this is printed in 1835, but it must have written prior to 18. He died in 1813, so it must have written prior to that. That's about 1800. And it's not mentioned. And you know, even when you look at the revolt, the, the guys, the rebels in the United States were all slave owners. They didn't want slave revolt. So, Patty, what uh, what is your impression of Spartacus? Mm -hmm. uh, is she still on, Patty? Yeah. Um, yes, I'm here. Um, I don't know. No overriding um, impressions. It, it interesting just hearing you guys discuss some. Um, you know, various perspectives on it. Um, I have have never been a particular fan other than knowing that uh, Kirk Douglas played him in the movie. But um, I don't know, I kind of enjoyed the discussion of slavery because my impression of slavery is that it probably began a couple of hours after the first humans arrived. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, yeah, that one's tricky. Slavery, as you know, is chattel slavery. And the assumption is you have property. And I'm not sure the early human cultures understood property. Well, as I think I, the way I said it was yeah. one yeah. sort of some one sort of slavery or another. Um, I, and I think probably women have perhaps um, different uh, perspectives on that. <laughs> so. Well, you, in any given culture, you've got a class of some sort. Historically, the upper, the lower class people had their rights restricted somehow. And like even the 20th century United States, the poll taxes were designed to keep Negroes from voting. They also designed, and, and the literacy tests were designed to keep Negroes from voting. They were also designed to keep poor white people from voting. Exactly, yeah. The assumption that these people are scum and they don't have the right to vote. And you, you just get these little grades of control. Were the serfs and, and were Russian serfs slaves or were they, were they peasants? Yeah, you I know, mean, it, a, slavery is just basically, you're right. Slavery is just basically, um, a very elemental form of classism, right? And um, so the most basic and most ancient people would have had the most elemental yeah. uh, systems of classism. Again, yeah, but then again, I'm not, I'm not sure how enslaved gladiators were. Somebody brought up the point that, that, that the, 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 these guys, if you own 300 gladiators, you had a military force at your disposal. Um, I, I kind of got into this because I've got I've got an article myself on how to run the Hunger Games, and I was commenting on the fact that if you in charge of a group of people, you have the choice of whether or not to treat the people savagely, and you have the choice of whether or not to arm them. And in the case of Spartacus, the Romans screwed up; they made the two wrong decisions, um, and they paid for it. Um, I'll yeah, no, I think I was just making that. Um, yeah. It just caused me to think of the condition in general, in terms of human history. I, yeah. You know, I mean, one thing, no matter what part of human history we're talking about, very similar patterns repeat over and over again. So I was just kind of making a quasi humorous yeah. co comment. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But it, uh, it is I just looked up uh, the, uh, the Rome, uh, Romain, the novel by Raffaello Giovannioli. Uh, it was published in Italian in 1874. Considered one, one of the best historical, historian Romans. Mm -hmm. 
Which one is this? Uh, John, you mean? John Yoli. Can you put it in the uh, in the chat? Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at. Okay. Just just a second. Yeah. So this. So, uh, Mr. Beck, you showed me a Thracian outfit of the Thracian warrior. How did you get that? Oh, you got muted. Stephen, you're muted. You got it, Stephen. I'm mute. Okay, here I'm mute again. No, try again. Yeah. You're yep. muted. I'm mute. I here. try. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Um, that was, uh, there is in the um, square, um, I'm trying to think, what was the name of the, the long square that we went to, uh, where the museum was? Uh, Navona, yeah. yeah. No, uh, Navona uh, Square in Rome. Oh, okay. There's something called a uh, Roman uh, a gladiator museum. It's really a glorified uh, tourist shop, but in the basement, they've collected did a number of uh, uh, basically re recreated uh, costumes and and uniforms and uh, and armor. It's quite uh, quite extensive. They do have a website, and the website does have pictures, and those are uh, those are available. Yeah. Uh, I also in another shop, I got some bobbleheads. <laughs> They're pretty cool. Mm -hmm. They uh, they made a, in the museum. They uh, they they explain uh, the both the uniforms. Uh, 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 a Mumilio version, very he heavily armored, and and the thra thrax, uh, and they uh, the thrax had a sika, which is kind of like a curved scimitar, which they believe might have been the uh, recreation of the uh, Thracian style. But that was the 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 system was uh, apparently under the Romans to 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 dr uh, have the uh, gladiators, regardless of where they were from dress up as uh, famous opponents of the Romans so you could show, you know, this is how we defeated them. Look at us, we're so cool. You know, we're so great. Um, but uh, as you as you said, they, uh, uh, as time went on, they they became, it became less. Uh, the, the other thing is that that's, that's also where the movie Gladiator kind of goes wrong. They make it look at just like this bloody melee, you know, with no point to it. Uh, when in fact it was a very highly structured, uh, uh, you know, athletic competition with a, with a, with a, um, uh, with someone who is a an official standing there with a pole, uh, monitoring the contest and uh, and giving instruction to the participants and kind of like the uh, the guy in the striped shirt in a, in a boxing match or. Uh, wrestling match oh i see uh so um so that was about all i found uh this there's not much in the classical museum in rome but there was that just that that one little display or so so another uh um yeah go ahead. yeah i just wanted to mention a uh another book you were talking about freedom this is by uh the um harvard uh historian orlando peterson he's a jamaican american and he makes a rather terrifying uh, uh, conclusion, which is that every slave society has been obsessed with freedom, that the definition of freedom is the, the opposite of slavery, that slavery is the, 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 is the, um, uh, the means by which you determine that you're free. And it's a, it's a rather terrifying concept. Um, and uh, he has a, a great deal to say about both Rome and uh, not much to say about Rome, but a lot to say about American slavery. Um, that's about it. Um, I'm also uh, kind of uh, taken by the uh, uh, the fact that some of the, the the later leaders in Julius Caesar's Jul Caesar and Cicero were both kind of junior officials in the in the era of the of the Spartacus revolt and might have picked up a few hints and yeah, and uh, subsequently Pompey uh, Caesar and Crassus uh, Trevorat initially Crassus helps Caesar 
um, you know, get 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 that uh, counselor position, and mm-hmm. then Trumpy marries Caesar's daughter, um, and they're falling out. Obviously, after Crassus, they said that Crassus was the the voice of reason between Pompey and Caesar, and therefore that Trumper had survived because of the uh, uh, because of Crassus. After he got beheaded by Parthians, uh, they kind of went astray, and also Pompey's wife, Caesar's daughter, dies, and that also causes the strife, and therefore the, it's another civil war. And we all know about Brutus <laughs> that mm-hmm. kills Caesar in the end, but Brutus was actually fighting on Pompey's side believe it or not. And Mm. Caesar, having to date Brutus' mother, uh, had sought Mm. out Brutus on the field and uh, basically said, do not kill Brutus. And therefore, you know, kind of harnessed a snake on his his neck that eventually stank him. And and, Mm. and we even, you know, we even have a word for it. Brutal, right? (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of, I'm I'm sorry to see that... uh... Uh, Shakespeare never got around to doing that story in the, uh, he, you know, he did Julius Caesar, but he never did Crassus, which would have, he, he borrowed a, a great deal from Plutarch. Doesn't, he loves Crassus doesn't mind. come across, Crassus doesn't come across as a tragic, I, when you read Plutarch carefully, a couple of, uh, Plutarch's prone to that. I did the presentation on Pyrrhus of Epirus, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, Plutarch's discussion of Pyrrhus is Greek tragedy. It's straight up Greek tragedy. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, he had a couple bit. I'm not sure Crassus works the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, Plutarch was willing to do that. We definitely did it with Pyrrhus. With Crassus, he just didn't like him. Yeah. Uh, you kind of got the sense that he's, you know, he's he's cruising for a bruising and. Uh, and also, he was quite a bit older. They they kind of uh, compressed the story, but uh, he was it was a good ten or twelve years after the Spartacus War that he take he goes back to try to take on the uh, the the Parthians, and does not realize um, that these are these are not just uh, you know barbarians. These people have heavy, heavily armored cavalry with um, heavyweight bows, and they're more than a match. For the Romans, yeah. who are only mainly infantry. Well, I'm looking at my timeline here. Our cross is yeah. about sixty. Um, was it was about sixty? Went to Parthia. <clears throat> I mean, it's easy to tell in my pine line on my timeline when he went there because he died there. So um, that's not you know lots of generals were in their sixties when they commanded troops. We have about, um, an hour. we have about a couple of minutes left. Let me yeah. just go through some of the uh, upcoming presentation yeah. quickly. Um, uh, so tonight we at 7 p.m. we have Asian philosophy, Confucianism of Tang Dynasty of 8th century. If you guys are interested in that, as Jason Tang is going to do that one. Tomorrow, if you guys are interested, we're doing a brief introduction of shamanism by Garrett P. Jackson. We'll talk about spirituality of shamanism. It's going to be very short, you know, maybe 30, 40 minutes or something like that. Uh, then on Thursday, Richard is doing French, um, you know, uh, colonizing Syria and Lebanon. Part two, uh, in particular, he's going to talk about Mahdists, uh, which is his 54th session that he's doing. Then on October 22nd, we are actually meeting in person. Uh, Stephen, if you're interested, we're going to Jewish Museum at 11 a.m. on Saturday. And then after that, we're going to go to an Indian restaurant called Flames Indian Aroma. Uh, that will be New York meeting, obviously. Howard, sorry. We're going to do one in Toronto. <laughs> Um, then on the September 29th, we're going to do Ugaritic language, part of a dead language series. We did Sumerian, we did Akkadian. We're basically nerding out at this language series and we talk about the alphabet of Ugarit. Ugarit was a Mesopotamian uh, city, um, you know, that was in Levant, Levant that basically was a port city and had a Sem- Semitic language. Uh, um, accustomed to it. Then on the October 30th, we have Herod the Great. It would be a Ralph and a Judean Revolt. Uh, that would be uh, October 30th. Then November 3rd, we're going to talk about Zionism and uh, Mandate of Palestine and Transjordan. Um, that would be November 3rd. And then November 6th, we're going to talk about Eleanor of Aquitaine, Powerful Women series. 
So do join for those if you can. Uh, my name of the meetup uh, history mostly ancient. Um, or there's another meetup that I run called New York City Museum Food and Travel. Or if you want, there's another meetup that I run called World History uh, or World History Enthusiasts. Uh, so join those and then I'll keep you, you know, up to date. We also have a YouTube channel called uh, History of Fitness uh, Philosophy. Just type that into in the um, in your search button, and you can it'll pop it right up. We're about forty three hundred members or so, uh, not members, subscribers. Sorry, no members. And um, I just want to wish everybody a nice mm -hmm. rest of the weekend. Thank you for everybody joining. Hope to see you soon on other ones. And um, I guess. So I'll see you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was good fun.